Good evening and welcome to Powder Baptist Chapel for our evening service for Sunday the 23rd of August that will go out on Wednesday the 26th. My name's Adam and I'm one of the pastors at the church. With a drive-in service on Sunday afternoon, we had an amazing time. For me, it was really special to be able to see lots of you. The car park was full, albeit socially distanced, and lots of others were listening in from outside. We hope to be able to show some of it in the future for those that weren't able to make it. But back to tonight, let's pray as we start. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the way we were able to be united together across the churches for the drive-in service. God, we pray even though we're not physically together for this service, that you would come and meet with each of us. Speak to us, we humbly ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our preacher tonight is Chris Cook. Chris and his wife Sue have been very involved in our Alpha course for many years and have a real passion to help people find and follow Jesus. Before we go over to Chris, Sue's going to read to us from Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 to 17. It's on page 226 of the Love Ringwood New Testaments. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, The wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self. With the, which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether you're, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, well, good evening. Uh, my name's Chris Cook. I hope everybody's been keeping well. It's difficult times, but we just got to get on the best way we can. Uh, tonight, we're going to be having a look at Colossians 3. Well, certainly the first 17 verses, and with the Lord's help, I'll do the very, very best I can to try and explain them to you. Really, it's the first four verses that set the benchmark. It reads, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, and not on earthly things. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
The Colossian Christians were truly converted. They had given their lives to Jesus, received forgiveness for their sins, but some of them had not really changed their lives very much. So Paul reminded them that because they had been raised with Christ, they should set their minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Paul had a similar gripe in his letter to the Romans. He had been talking about the grace of God and been telling the Roman Christians that their salvation did not depend on their works, but on God's grace. So before we go on, let me ask you a question. If you died today and stood before God and he asked, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? I mean, that question really gets to the heart of what are you trusting in for eternal life? I mean, what do you really believe? Do you believe that being a good person or doing good deeds will get you into heaven? The Bible is very clear. It tells us that every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that there is no one who is truly righteous before God. As a result, no one can earn their way into heaven. No matter how many good works we may do, or how holy and pleasing they might look in God's sight. Salvation is by grace through faith alone, not as a result of good works, so that God alone gets all the glory. The free gift of salvation can only be received by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, not by any type of works, no matter how holy those works may be. If you want that free gift of eternal life, then the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, If you confess with your mouth, your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Simply ask Jesus for, for forgiveness of your sins. We've all sinned, by the way, every single one of us. And then invite him into your life. If you need help, ring one of the churches. I promise that every single one of them will help you. If you need literature or a New Testament Bible, send an email or in Paula Baptist Chapel. There's a little saying in Christian circles, let go and let God. Believe me, it's harder to do, harder to do than what it sounds. We don't mind handing it to God, we just have a problem letting go. But God can do amazing things for us when we let him, when we ask him for forgiveness of our sins and let go of our cares and worries and trust in him for our salvation. <clears throat> Sam Shoemaker, co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, once said, Make an act of self-surrender. Gather up your sins and needs, put them together, bring them to Christ for forgiveness and help. What is important is that you let go, let go of your sins and your fears and your inhibitions. Tonight we're going to look at three points. We're going to look at the old man or the sinful nature, the new man or who am I in Christ, and thirdly, enjoying God and staying focused on Jesus. So first of all, uh, the old man or sinful nature. <clears throat> We're told to put to death what is worldly. Paul even makes two lists of things we should get rid of, or as Paul said, we are to put off these things things that are not in keeping with our new life in Christ, things like sexual immorality, immoral passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is really a form of idolatry. The first list has to do with the passions of our hearts. It deals with things like sex, money, and feelings. The second list is different. In it, Paul tells us to avoid anger, wrath, cruelty, insults, and shameful speaking. In other words, keep your tongue under tight control. The word translated put off is ekdo. It means taking off clothes. Here, when referring to the old man or the sinful life, it implies the stripping off of dirty old clothes at the end of the day. The phrase put on, or the new man, indicates putting on fresh clean clothes after removing dirty ones. The message kind of describes the old man of a set of badly fitted dirty clothes, while the new man is like a new fresh wardrobe. 
implying not just one article of clothing or one small part of our lives, but the entirety. The McCarthy Study Bible says, because the old man died in Christ and the new man lives in Christ, believers must put off remaining sinful deeds and be in the process of being continually renewed in the Christ-likeness to which they are called. I once heard a modern illustration regarding the putting off of the old and the putting on of the new man. The reference of removing clothing was changed to the process of tattoo removal. The point was that the removing of a tattoo can sometimes take several treatments, just as the, just as the putting off of the old sinful nature is ongoing. Also, letting go of the old self, just like tattoo removing, can be very painful. But it has to go. Paul uses the terminology, put to death. The ancient Greek word translated put to death is nekru. Its full meaning is to make dead, to put to death, slay, to deprive of power, destroy the strength of. It tells us that there are some things that must take place in the Christian's life. They must go. They must be cut out like a disease. They must be completely removed, obliterated. It is a, re a command that requires a vital action on the part of the believer. God has done this part in Jesus, now we must do ours. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 31 to 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Which kind of nicely brings us to the new man, or who am I in Christ? So I thought we might look at a few Bible verses. Let's see what God has to say. Corinthians chapter 2 verse 5, uh, uh, chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. It's really what we've just been talking about. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Don't you find it exciting knowing that God has already got something up his sleeve for us to do? There's something that keeps kind of popping up. It's come up two or three times in the last couple of weeks and I want to share it with you. Out of some seven billion people on our planet, God has chosen you. He has chosen you to do something very, very special that only you with the guidance of the Holy Spirit can do. Does that not make you feel really, really special? Some people can easily feel inadequate because others around them look more talented, but they only look it. There's a little saying that I really need you to remember, that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. As Christians, we have a special place in God's family. We have become a new creation through spiritual birth. By faith in Jesus Christ, we are an elect race and now part of God's kingdom. We have been made heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And finally, Sue's favourite, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I could go on quoting verses all day, but really, who am I in Christ? Well, I am God's child. I have been chosen by God and adopted into his family. I am a member of Christ's body. I have been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. 
I have direct access to God through what Jesus did on the cross. I am free from any condemn condemnation brought against me and I cannot be separated from the love of God. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love and of a sound mind. And finally, I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. In short, I am an ambassador for Christ. In Christ we exchange the old for the new, the damaged and imperfect for that which is true and honest. Paul explains we become a new creation, the old things have passed away, behold the new have come. The saving act of God was the death and resurrection of Jesus, he lived a sinless life and suffered on the cross. Christ was punished for our sins. His resurrection was the proof that God accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. What's absolutely amazing is God's renewal work in us has nothing to do with our birthright or actions. We all need God's salvation through Jesus in order to be a part of his family. It's only in him that we're made new. No matter what your ancestry, whether royalty or peasants, no matter where you're from, your gender or ethnicity. The BBC had a television show called Who Do You Think You Are? It featured a famous person exploring everything from distant relatives, possibly royal connections or ancestors that may have emigrated. Contestants would often say, I hope this experience will help me understand myself and my family better. Have you ever asked yourself these questions? What's my purpose? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? What is my true identity? I don't think you're alone. I think we've all wondered at some point. When I was a child, maybe five-ish, round about that, my older brother and myself had to go live with my grandma. My mother and father was going through a, a divorce. We didn't know that at the time. We were just sent to live with my grandma. We didn't really know why. We just had to do what we were told to do in them days. That's just the way that it was. I mean, we were there for maybe two, two and a half years in total. My grandma lived in Oldham and we lived in Bradford. They're probably about 35 miles apart, which seems nothing by today's standards. But if you consider that there was no motorways, nobody had a, a car and nobody had telephones. So to see her maybe three times in the two years, that were the all, all that I saw. So it was a bit of an horrific time for us. Bad memory that still lingers, if you understand what I mean. I mean, a couple of Yorkshire lads in the Lancashire school it was nightmare time, it really, really was. But I remember the day when I went back home. I can remember it really, really well. And as we got home, I remember turning around that my dad wasn't anywhere in sight. I said to my mum, where's my dad? She said, this is your dad. And there was this new guy that I didn't know from Adam. I'd never seen him before in my life. And I'm supposed to accept him as dad. So I said, he's not my dad, where's my dad? And I went running in the house looking for my dad. And, and while everybody else in the family, well, I have uh, an older brother, a younger brother and sister. My younger brother and sister stayed with my mother and my stepfather, if you like. And they were part of a family. They'd become a family unit on themselves. When my older brother and myself went back, we were no longer part of the family, especially me because I struggled with a stepfather. My older brother didn't seem to have the same problem, he called him dad. I had to call him Uncle Bill because I, I refused to call him dad. He wasn't my dad, I wanted my real dad. I think, looking back, that I must have been my father's favourite. Favorite. I know that he used to take me to work with him on a Saturday morning. My older brother was asthmatic and my dad was an engineer so he couldn't take me in that environment. And he'd take me on a Saturday morning, leave me in the clocking in office with a lucky bag and a comic. And I really used to look forward to it. So I, I grew up really, really missing my dad. We only ever saw him one time after that. We were kind of raised on a lie. My mother said that we'd all planned on going to live in Canada. My real father said that he'd gone to vet the place out and he never come back. 
and that was a, that was a line that we were raised upon. My older brother and myself, when we got to our late teens, went searching for our real father. We didn't really have a life with my mother and her new husband, and um, uh, my younger brother and my sister. They were a, a family unit in their own right. We were never really part of it, and that was made very, very clear. So we went looking for our real father. We never found him, but we found an auntie that we never knew existed that lived about 500 yards from my brother. And she kind of filled in a lot of gaps. We also found out that day that we had a grandma and grandfather on my, on my real father's side that we was never allowed to see. By the time we'd found out of their existence, they'd died. So there was a huge part of our life that we completely missed out on. I found it really, really difficult to forgive my mother for that one, if I'm being honest with you. And I didn't see him for a couple of years. I mean, there's a bit more involved in all that one, but that's kind of how it went on. But one thing I remember really, really well is the, the day that I forgot what my dad looked like. I was about 14 years old. And I was trying to think of my dad and I just couldn't focus on his face. From a distance, I could see him. And as I started to focus in on his face, it turned into my brother's face. And that was the most frightening part of my life. I felt like that, like I'd lost my own identity. And it's important to know who we are. But really, your true identity is not found in who you are, but whose you are. And the moment that you accept Jesus into your life as your Lord and Saviour, you are his. You become, he becomes your identity. That doesn't make us perfect. It means we're being made perfect. Perfect in his image. In fact, the church is far from perfect, but it does its best. So I'm, I thought I'd put a few bulletin bloopers in just to show you that we make mistakes too. Now these are not necessarily from Pounder, by the way, but I just thought I'd slip them in. Number one, ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around the house. Oh, don't forget your husbands. Number two, next week's sermon is on hell. A warm welcome is extended to all. Number three, Weight Watchers will meet at 7pm at the First Presbyterian Church. Please use large double doors at the side entrance. And finally, my favourite. Don't let worry kill you off. The church can help. You know, being Christians doesn't mean we can't have fun. In fact, enjoying God is a command. It's sinful not to enjoy Him. Did you know that? And that kind of nicely brings me up to my third point. Enjoying God and staying focused on Jesus. If I was to talk about fearing God, or being or loving God, it would be seen as quite acceptable in Christian circles. But the thought of, the, of enjoying God could be seen as a bit odd. But the Bible clearly says that we should delight ourselves in the Lord. In fact, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which really is a set of questions on Christian life, Says, question one says, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Question two, what rule have, have God given to direct us how we may should glorify and enjoy him? Answer, the word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. So I guess the next question must be, is your relationship with God enjoyable? Does it hit the mark of inner joy and peace? A satisfaction beyond anything you can imagine? Are you having fun with the Lord? Shall we see what the Bible has to say? Well, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 31 says, Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Chronicles chapter 16 verse 33 says, Let the trees of the forest sing 
Let them sing for joy before the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says, Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Having faith in God's promises gives strength to those who trust him, and God never fails to keep his promises. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with, with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasure at your right hand. What David is really saying here is that because of his belief, because of his incredible faith, he knows that one day he will be with God forever. Luke chapter 6 verse 23 says, Rejoice in that day and leave for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. Did you know that we are hardwired for joy? We have this insatiable hunger for happiness. Really, it's part of what it means to be created in God's image. Psalm 37 verses 3 to 5 say, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will do this. What really comes to mind with these verses is this. It's a command to be joyful. It isn't something we need to pray about or even consider. It's not meant to be optional. It's a responsibility. Simply put, delighting in God, enjoying God, is our Christian duty. As John Piper said, pleasure is the measure of our treasure. Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42 seem to bring this point across well. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her, opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he, had said, to, to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will be not taken away from her. Can you imagine opening your front door to find Jesus on the garden path chatting with his, his, his disciples? I mean, to be fair, Martha showed amazing kindness and definitely had the gift of hospitality. Mary, on the other hand, just wanted one of Jesus. She was simply enjoying him. As the story starts to unfold, we find Mary sitting in the middle of the living room floor at the feet of Jesus, soaking up his words. Mary's, Mary was having a great time with Jesus and everything he had to say. Martha, well... She's rushing around the kitchen like a chicken with its head cut off, checking the roast beef and Yorkshire pudding, setting the table and trying to finish off the jam roly poly. This woman is on a mission and will not stop until all the work is done and the guests are happy with full stomachs. Mary caught, uh, Martha caught a glimpse of Mary, sat at Jesus' feet and then resentment kicked in. She said, Lord, do you not care that my sister's left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. The problem with Martha, she got distracted. The Greek word, which I can't pronounce by the way, has the implication of being pulled or dragged in different directions. It caused her to drive a wedge between her sister and herself. And she even blamed Jesus, which is something we'd never do, right? It's pretty easy to imagine how Martha must have felt irritated, aggravated, angry. Why should she be doing all the work? Wasn't it only right for Mary to be helping out too? In fact, Martha felt so justified in her resentment that she talked to Jesus about it. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. But instead of backing her up, Jesus rebuked her. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, and it won't be taken from her. 
Wow, as Mr. Roberts would say, that must have felt like a right kick in the teeth. Here she was doing everything in her power to be a good host, and Mary just sat there doing nothing. You know, it can become so easy for us to get wrapped up in all the things that we need to do, or possessions we must have, or even get judgmental, that we lose sight of what the most important thing is, and that is Jesus. A few years ago, a few of us went to the Alpha Convention in London. Two of the guest speakers were Rick Warren, Senior Pastor of Saddleback Church in California, and his lovely wife Kay. It was shortly after they lost, lost their son. Rick said, because he was in the limelight, if you will, he had to be seen to be strong. But behind closed doors it was a different matter. It just broke down, and without Jesus in the life, they would have both just fallen apart. I think that every parent, no matter how strong a faith or how close to the Lord, would feel no different. I really grew to like, to like Rick and Kay that weekend and how they opened up to everybody. Kay says something that really touched my heart. She said, things are different now. Some things don't seem important anymore. She said, I don't care if the curtains don't match the carpet or the cushions don't match, well, whatever cushions match, I suppose. She said, people are out there dying. There's far more important things to focus on. They need Jesus. And it was in keeping her focus on Jesus that really pulled her through. Before we finish, let me ask you a question. If you don't know Jesus, what's stopping you? If you're one of them people that's been listening in uh, to some of the talks, what's actually stopping you from giving your life to Jesus? Do you feel that you don't need him or you're too busy rushing around? Just let me finish with this little story. It's about two men walking through the woods and they heard a noise behind them. And they turn around to see what it is, and there's this eight foot grizzly coming after them. So they take off. One of them climbs up a tree, the other one sees a cave and runs into the cave. The bear stood halfway between the tree and the cave. After about 15 20 seconds, the guy in the cave went running towards his mate in the tree. He saw the bear, turned around, and went back into the cave. About 10 or 15 seconds later, he come darting out again towards the tree where his mate was, saw the bear, turned round again. Another 10 or 15 seconds, he come running out of, out of the cave towards the tree, saw the bear, turned round, headed back for the cave. His mate shouted out, why don't you just stay in the cave? He said, there's another bear in there. Let me ask you this one question. Are you the one up a tree that thinks he, that think he's safe, but only thinks they're safe? Or are you the one that's caught between a rock and a hard place, not knowing really which way to turn? Let me tell you something, my friends. You need Jesus. And maybe now is that time to just say, Lord, forgive my sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, for your love for us. Thank you for adopting us into your family, allowing us eternal life with you, knowing not only who we are, but whose we are. And thank you, Lord, that we may have enjoyment with you. Thank you, Lord, for holding us up in times when we could have given up. Lord, I thank you that even though the world may be in a dark place right now, that we can trust in you for our protection. Lord, I thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, many thanks indeed, Chris, for tonight's message. And thank you loads for being with us this evening, everybody else. Um, I'm going to be away next week, but I'm very grateful to Andrew Osler, who'll be leading the morning service, and Andrew Clark, who's going to be leading the evening service as well. So it's a Sunday of Andrews. But in the meantime, I trust and pray that we can indeed, with God's help, put off our old way of living and instead be clothed with Jesus and his ways and not miss out on all that God has for us to do and enjoy. So God bless, stay safe, and as ever, stay in touch. <laughs>